Timothy, the first chapter. Second Timothy, the first chapter, the sixth verse. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. And in verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Can somebody say, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I want to preach this morning living beyond the fear factor. Now, I kind of bumped into this Wednesday night because I, it has been upon me, but I want somebody to be released from fear this morning. Lord Jesus, I thank you today for being such a kind and wonderful Savior. And I ask you, Lord, today to anoint these lips of clay, anoint every ear to hear. Bring understanding to our mind. Help us, Lord, today, mighty God, to fall in love with you and understand that we walk by faith and not by fear. And we give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Everybody said, in Jesus' name. I just like saying in Jesus' name. Amen. There's just something about the name of Jesus. There's authority in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I honor him and reverence him today. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank you for standing for the reading of God's word. Amen. Now. I don't mean to start out with a carnal reference, but I am going to. So please forgive me if I offend you. I don't mean to. But um, in recent time, reality programs have taken over our society. And I can recall one of the first reality programs that ever hit the waves of, of our society. And it was called Fear Factor. Perhaps you have seen it. Perhaps you have not. But regardless, it was basis was so that an individual could face their fears and overcome them to win a prize. It had snakes. And you know, I just felt like tonight, today, that we needed to help somebody overcome. I've got a whole bucket of uh, spiders. <laughs> Some of y'all like, brother, brother Thomas, he was able, we was able to go try to catch some fish, and he caught them, and I tried on Monday, and, uh, and I asked him when we got out there in the middle of the water, I said, hey, did you kill that big spider that was on the side of your boat? And he said, what big spider? Now, regardless, he jumped in the water anyway, but he let me know if there's a spider, he, he would be exiting the boat. But this is just something that he's had a bad time with in the past. It's a fear. Heights. Some folks don't like heights. You know, I, I'm, I'm a little larger than my father. He's five foot six. I don't think he's ever weighed more than 160 pounds. And uh, he has no fear of heights. And we, we did many roof jobs growing up and and uh, my frame is not like his frame. I'm not the monkey he is. I'm just going to tell it like it is. It doesn't matter what the, uh, if it was a 12-12 pitch or an 8-12 pitch. It didn't matter if it was two or three stories high. That didn't bother him. I get up there, I'm cautious. I'm careful. I'm tied off. He's bouncing all over the place, and I'm just trying to hold on for dear life. I don't want to say I'm afraid of heights, but I've got a healthy respect for them. Closed-in spaces. Anybody have a fear of closed-in spaces? You get claustrophobic, you know. Some guys can't work in certain places because they're claustrophobic. I'm sure Brother uh, Bacchus deals with that sometimes, especially in those tanks, when guys get in those tanks and they start panicking and they have to calm them down. And Maybe you have one of these fears, but fears are not... Um, 
unnatural for us. Because it's something that uh, every one of us, you know, I have a healthy respect for snakes. You can call it a fear, or I call it great respect. Amen. And um, it, it's gotten better because I've under, I understand that not all snakes are bad. If you have a king snake, you might want to keep him around. He helps keep away the rats and uh, the poisonous snakes. But our problem is, is that when we see just the embodiment of a snake, we don't take time to identify. Because <laughs> in our mind, a snake is a snake. And it has no business here. <laughs> you know, there are other folks that have fear of, of dogs, fear of horses, fear of uh, just different things. It's something that, you know, I'm just not comfortable with, so I'm not going to have anything to do with that. There are those that have a fear of being electrocuted or a fear of drowning. They have a fear of water. Amen. That's something you have to overcome. From the time we're small children, you know, I, I took all, all my children swimming, and, and my big boys now... Malachi accuses me of when he was Jonathan's age of just picking him up and throwing him in the water. Now, I don't believe I did that, but he accuses me of that. But yet, when we went to the place to go swimming, he and Micah, they run and they jump in the water. There's no fear. But I'm still working on Jonathan to convince him that the water is not to be, af you don't have to be afraid of the water. In fact, once he had his floaties on his arms and we got him out there and we turned him loose and he was able to float and he, you saw a change come over him. The fear began to turn to faith. Hey, I can float. And sometimes that is the way it is with us. When somebody's gone through something, they're ready to go jump head in first. Hey, let's just go. We got this. No problem. But somebody that's never walked a certain path, they're more hesitant because of the uncertainty. Fear is that emotion or a passion excited by an expectation of evil. Now when I read that, I, I thought, well, you know, that's, that's true. Many times our fear is based upon an expectation of something that could be bad. An apprehension of an impending danger. Fear expresses Amen. Less apprehension than dread and dread less than terror and fright. And yet it is this, this uh, emotion that's built into us to create caution. It helps us stay safe. It's like it's a built-in mechanism to keep us safe. And yet sometimes, amen, it hinders us. It hinders us. From achieving, amen, great things. It's when people overcome their fears that they can begin to achieve great things. When a man gets over his fear of climbing a mountain, amen, he may cling to the side, but eventually he gets to the top. Amen. It's a man's fear of, of the great big wave. Amen. There's a, there's a wave called the Maverick out there in California. It's 25 or 40 feet high and it's just a huge massive wave and not every man can uh, can tackle that particular wave but there's just a few that says despite the fear that I feel the adrenaline that I feel I'm going to do my best to climb on top of this wave there have been men who have lost their life and yet still some knowing that they could lose their life climb on top of the wave to ride it because of the rush fear has helped men to fly Throughout ages of time, men knew the history of flight. I remember as a child reading Greek mythology about the man that created the wings with the bird feathers and the wax. And when he went on top to fly, he had these great massive wings on him. But the sun melted the wax and when he went to fly, he fell to his death. So throughout history, man maybe has tried to fly 
And the Wright brothers could have said, well, you know, well, what happens if our wax melts? Or what happens if this goes wrong? Or what happens if that goes wrong? And all the what ifs. And, and we do that a lot of times. And we, instead of saying, you know, I, I think this is going to work. If they had sat there and just said, well, we can't do it because of this. And we can't do it because of that. And we can't do it because of all these things. They'd have never flown. And too many times we let fear control our actions. We let fear dictate our future. I'll never be able to finish school. I'm too old. That's, that's a fear factor. I know of an individual who was 70 years old before they got their law degree, but they just had a purpose in them. I'm going to finish. Raised a family and, and, and went back to school, and they were you know, past the prime of going to school, but they had it set in their heart, what I want to do, what I want to achieve, I'm going to do it. Fear says that uh, you're too old. Fear says that uh, you're too disabled. Fear says that you don't have the education. And yet, if you will step out by faith, you can overcome your fear. Then there's filial fear. Fear is a fear that is used to express a passion. In good men, the fear of God is a holy awe or reverence of God, God and His laws which springs from a just view and real love of the divine character, leading the subjects of it to hate and shun everything that can offend such a holy being and inclining them to aim at perfect obedience. This is filial fear. In fact, the Lord told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 32, I will put fear in their hearts. But he's not talking so much about the fear of being afraid of what should happen. Now, I want to bring both of these into light because as I step forward in the message, I want you to understand, amen, where we should have fear. We should always have that godly fear, amen, reverence for Him to do what's right, but we do not have to fear the unknown. John tells us in 1 John 4 and 17, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Too many times we walk in a state of fear, a state of the unknown, a state of wondering what tomorrow holds. Thank you, Brother Waddy. We, we, we stand in a place where we allow circumstances to control us. We allow situations to dictate to us, uh, amen, our tomorrow. I refuse to live in that place. There's going to come a time in your life where you're just going to have to face your fear, come face to face with it, amen. But understand this, that perfect love casteth out all fear, amen, because fear hath torment. Fear has torment. And the devil loves nothing more than to torment the saints of God. He loves nothing more than to have you worrying and doubting and worrying all the time about what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and, and, and if this is going to take place, and, and that's going to take place. I want you to know when you're walking in the love of the Lord, you can tell Satan, get thee behind me. I have no time for you. Amen. You know what? Mamas kind of know what fear is. I mean, the Lord blesses them with a bundle of joy. And for those first few months, they get to hold it. They get to keep it. They get to hold it close. But after a while, it starts squirming. Starts rolling. Starts moving. And once they start moving, honey, that's it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Now, I know some of you would, would, would just love to, you know, uh, 
put a strap to them. Just take that umbilical cord and just keep it attached to them the rest of their life. Hello? Any of you mamas know what I'm talking about? You know, because they're going to climb. They're going to get into everything. They're going to explore. Amen. They may have billy goat syndrome. You might catch them digging in the trash. Because they're curious. Huh? Hey, I'm speaking from experience. I've had five of them. I know what I'm talking about. They're interested in, in what's going on. You can't leave stuff laying around because they'll get into it. You can leave the mop water out. They might try to see how it tastes. See, y'all laughing because you know I'm telling the truth. And on that first day of school when, when uh, you know, you, you hope that child is clinging to you as much as, they, as you're clinging to them, but most times they're like, Bye, Mom. And mom's like, I'm going to walk you to class. And I mean, it's like, especially if you're a little boy. Oh, come on, mom. Any men know what I'm talking about? I mean, and, and for daddies, it's harder with the girls, you know. They're supposed to stay daddy's little girl, but then they grow up. And the only time they call you is when they want something. Well, praise God, anyhow. And you fear, you, you know, you, you want to, to keep them from harming themselves, and that's natural. But then there's that time when you have to let go and let God have his way in their life. If he gave them to you, that was a gift to you from God. Amen. And you're going to have to be like Hannah and be willing to give it back. And say, Lord, I put them in your care. Lord, I am going to trust you to keep them. Lord, I'm going to trust you to provide for them. Yes. Amen. That's a hard thing to do as a parent. Yes. Amen. Because we don't want anything bad to happen. Is that right? Yes. But the perfect love casts us out fear. Perfect love. So love that child. Love that child. And don't let fear torment you. But encourage that child. Because sometimes generational fear hinders the child of the next generation from accomplishing everything that they could be. Well, nobody in our family's ever done that. Nobody in our family's ever gone to college and got a degree. Nobody in our family has ever achieved that prominence. So, you know, just, just stay. But, you know, that's fear. And sometimes... We let our culture and we let, uh, you know, who we are hold us back from accomplishing what we can accomplish in the next generation. But if we release them in love and say, go do what God has called you to do. Go accomplish what God has called you to accomplish. You can do anything. You can do anything that you set your mind to. Amen. Amen. That's something that was drilled into me from the time I was very little. Son, you can do anything you want to do if you have the, the drive enough to do it. Uh, if you can get out there and get after it, you can accomplish it. Uh, hey, but you can't do it being lazy, son. You can't do it, amen, not taking a risk or two. Amen. If you're going to be successful in business, you're going to have to take some risk. You are. If you're going to be successful in life, you're going to have to take some risk. You're going to have to be able to step out sometimes, even though it may seem like uh, there's nothing to step out on. Uh, but if you're living for the Lord, the Bible tells me that the footsteps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. And if I will trust in him and know that everywhere I step, uh, he's ordered my step. I just got to stay righteous. I just got to stay holy. I just got to stay right with him. He will lead the way. Amen. So if we know that we have the love of God living within us, then we do not have to fear for the Lord, what does the scripture say, has not given us the spirit of fear. 
He has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power. Love and a sound mind. Brother Waddy, there's just something about that. I am not powerless, but I am filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. I don't have to fear what the enemy wants to bring against me. I don't have to fear what the enemy brings against this church. I don't have to fear people. I don't have to fear men. I don't have to fear the devil. Amen. Because the Lord is on my side. So I'm not going to worry about what could happen. I'm not going to worry about uh, what could go sideways. Uh, amen. The Lord hadn't given me a spirit of fear, but he has given me a spirit of authority in the Holy Ghost, uh, the power of God living within me. He's given me a spirit of love. Amen. He's given me a spirit of love. Because it makes you love everybody. Huh? Even people that do you wrong. You know, God, you know the Lord's working on you when you've done something, and you, even though it's not real offensive, but it offended somebody. And they call them, ball you out. Anybody ever been balled out before? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm, we are in Texas. Now, if there's any of you city slickers from the north here, I'll have to explain it to you later. You know, chew on you a little bit. Instead of you chewing back, you just said, you know what, I am so sorry that offended you. Even if it really wasn't offensive. But when you're full of love, full of the Holy Ghost... Amen. You know what? I'm so sorry. I, I apologize. I'll make it right. Amen. But the flesh won't allow that to happen. Fear wants to battle back. Fear wants to survive. And of a sound mind. The old timers used to say it like this. I want to thank the Lord for waking me up with a sound mind and body today. They're going to give praise God for a sound mind and some good health. I wish more of us could get that way today. Sometimes we forget how precious it is to have a sound mind and a sound body. We, we, we mumble and complain about the littlest things, but I thank God that I have a sound mind. Amen. One elder said, you know, I'm not as strong as I used to be, but I still got a sound mind. Amen. I'm still right in my head. I want to stay right in my head, somebody. Why would he say that? Too many times we allow fear to mess with our mind. And you're trying to, to have faith and, amen, you're trying to believe. But yet, you know, mama's been diagnosed with cancer and, and you know, this is going on and that's going on. And, and, and situations are all around. You know what? If you're not careful, the devil can attack your mind. That's why people have a nervous breakdown because they don't have a sound mind. They're worried about everything that could go wrong. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. And let me just tell you something. You can't handle everything. Handle what you can and what you can't give to God. Oh, somebody needs to hear that again. Handle what you can and the rest give over to the Lord. When I come up against things that I, I guess is just too much for me, I just say, now, Lord, I can't handle this. You're going to have to handle this situation. It's just too much for me. I've done all that I can do, but now I need you to step in. And let me tell you something. He's more than big enough to handle any problem in your life. He's more than big enough, amen, to meet any need in your life, any situation, any circumstance. But you've got to be willing to say, Lord, I give it to you. 
First Peter said, cast your cares upon him for he careth for you. Uh, sometimes we forget how much he cares, uh, how much he loves us, how much he wants to do us good. Uh, and too many times uh, we allow fear to stop us from having the faith uh, to trust in the Lord. Amen. It is the unknown that causes us to worry. The what if or how am I going to make it if it keeps up or, uh, you know, uh, you know well, what are we going to do? And, and so we stay up all night walking the floor. And I'm not just preaching, amen, from, from some head knowledge. I'm talking about from some actual living the life a little bit. Uh, where I walk the floor all through the midnight hour because I was so entrenched in fear and worry and doubt and unbelief, uh, amen, that I could not even sleep. Uh, and so I would just stay up fretting, not really praying in faith, uh, but praying in fear. And I'm going to tell you something. Fear, prayer is weak prayer. I know. It's still prayer, but it's a weak prayer. It's a pleading prayer. It's, a, it's a, almost a desperation prayer that has no strength. I'm talking from experience, but I've learned this. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word. He has proven to me time and time again I got this. Yes. Yes. Hello? Amen. I'm wanting to get that in some of your spirits. That when you're praying, I want you to hear the Lord say to you, I got this. Right. Amen. I was praying over some situations this week, Brother Waddy, and the Lord just kept saying, I got this. All right. I got this. Hallelujah. No problem. I got this. Right. Amen. And some of you are dealing with situations on your job, dealing with situations in your life, dealing with situations in this area and that area. And I want you to know the Lord come to tell you this morning, I got this. I got this. You don't have to worry. You don't have to doubt. You don't have to not trust me. I got you. I've got you in the palm of my hand. I know right where you're at. I know right where you're living. If you will humble yourselves and trust in me, I've got you, child of God. You don't have to worry. Hallelujah. It's good to know he's got me today. Hallelujah. It's good to know. Psalms 34. It's a wonderful chapter, Psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. He said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. The first thing he know, you notice in getting beyond any fear is I'm going to praise the Lord at all times. I'm going to bless him at all times. I'm going to glorify him at all times. Not just when everything's going good. No, that's not the only time we ought to shout. Sometimes you ought to shout when it ain't going so good. Anybody can shout when you're feeling good, but what about when the whole world's turned upside down on you? Can you still get out in the aisle and do a little jig for Jesus? Well, you say, Brother Bumgarner, I don't feel the Spirit. Sometimes you need to dance before the Lord before you ever feel the Spirit. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that David was in the spirit when he danced before the Lord. Uh, amen. He just wanted to dance before the presence of God. He was ushering it in. Uh, and too many times uh, we predicate our worship to him based on a feeling instead of a knowing. Do I need to say that? Too many times you predicate your worship on a feeling. Oh, it feels good. I feel the spirit. I'm going to get up and dance a little bit. No, honey, if you would dance before you ever felt something, amen, the Holy Ghost could come in this house. Perhaps your situation could be changed. Perhaps your situation could be turned around based on your praise. Hallelujah. But we hang our head. We hang our head. 
Too many times we only sing part of the song. Trouble in my way. I got to cry sometimes. Trouble in my way. I got to cry sometimes. Trouble in my way, Pastor. That bully on the job won't let up. Every time I turn around, I'm broke. We'll pay your tithes. You'll, you'll get out of that situation. <laughs> but we forget. We forget the other part of the song. Everybody's going to have trouble. The Bible says the man's days are few and full of trouble. But one thing I've learned, even when I have trouble, and the reason I like that particular song, I know it talks about trouble, but at the end of the chorus it says, I know Jesus will fix it. After a while. I may not know when. I may not know how, and I may be in a world of trouble, but I'm going to trust in my Jesus. He's got it all under control. He's going to fix it, and he's going to fix it right. He does things right. So when you praise him, amen, praise him with all your heart. Praise him with all your might. Praise him with all your strength. Amen. You may not feel like praising him. Amen. The boss may have cussed you. You may have fought with your wife on the way to church. Ooh, it just got quiet in here. Like, ooh, a nerve. I just, I just hit a nerve. Be like the man and the woman that came to church fussing in the fight and then they got to church and, and uh, she was sawed up and and he started worshiping God and shouting and running the aisle. And, you know, and she just sat there. And, and on the way home, she said, well, you, you made quite a demonstration of yourself today. Get up there and act like you're all spiritual worshiping God when, when you had a fight with me on the way to church. He said, I wasn't mad with the Lord. I was mad with you. I knew we'd fix. We'll, we'll, we'll get this all ironed out, honey, but... Uh, I can't let you hinder my praise. And too many times we let circumstances hinder our worship. Too many times we let the fear, amen, of where I'm at right now say, you can't worship the Lord because you're not where you should be. Why don't you, despite where you're at right now, worship the Lord anyhow? Some of y'all didn't hear that. Despite where you're at right now, why don't you just worship the Lord? Despite whether you're half backslid or half right or half in or half out, when you come to the house of God, at least worship him. Perhaps, just perhaps, uh, he can pull you out of that sp place of despair and give you a strength you did not know. Amen, amen, amen. He goes on to say, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me. And what did he do? I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. So there must be something about seeking the Lord. There must be something about getting a hold of God. Because once he hears you, uh, he will deliver you. Well, praise God. Too many times instead of taking our fears to the Lord... We take them to Facebook. Thank you, Brother Thomas. But that's truth this morning. 
Amen. Sometimes it's best not to say anything at all. Because really you're just speaking out of fear. You're speaking out of frustration. You're speaking out of... You know what I've learned? The more I can't control, the less I say. I just get into prayer about it. Let God have it. I want Him to deliver me from my fears. Perhaps you're comfortable living in your fears, but I, I don't like things to have control over me. And that's what fear does. It controls you. Amen. It, it, it allows uh, things to have dominion over you. Amen. Now, we talked in the natural. You know, there's things that happen that, you know, control us uh, in our mind. Because we've been taught, don't mess with these things. Leave these things alone. They're bad for you. But there are those that have overcome their fears. Amen. And there may be an alligator in the water, but they'll jump right in with the alligator because they don't have a fear of it. They'll wrestle it. Man lost his life. Now, he had, he, he didn't, uh, you know, he, he boarded a line. But you know the All-Australian guy, you know. Every time he had a chance, he tried to do something silly. And there's a, there's a, but he didn't let fear control him. And he died doing what he loved. But the truth is, is that too many times, the fear of things, the fear of life can control us have dominion over us. And that is not the will of God. That's why I'm seeking the Lord. So that He can deliver me from all my fears. They looked unto Him and were enlightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear Him. Now, there's fear again, but yet, in this time, we're talking about filial fear. Before, we're talking about fear that dominates, that controls us. But now we're talking about that reverence fear. Because the angels of the Lord encamp about them that fear Him. That reverence Him. That respect Him. And delivereth them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. Oh, fear the Lord, reverence the Lord, ye, ye saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. And so, amen, when we get beyond the fear factor, amen, it is that place of reverence, uh, amen, not a fear of doubt, of dread of what could happen, but a trusting in God, knowing he is in control, uh, knowing that there is nothing too hard for the Lord. Verse Psalms 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. And the only way, amen, the Lord won't hear your cry is if you're unrighteous. Think about it. Now, I'm not saying you don't hear your prayers. I'm just saying the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. What does that mean? He's watching me. If I live righteously, he's watching me. And he's just waiting to hear from me. Don't you want to be in that place where he's watching and hearing that no matter what you're going through, he cares, he understands, he desires to move on your behalf? Come on, too many times we think God doesn't care but his eyes are upon you he is watching you he cares for you he loves you the righteous cry and the lord heareth and deliver them out of all of their troubles many are the afflictions of the righteous but the lord delivereth him out of them all out of them all too many times we're worried about tomorrow too many times we're worried about those that come against us. Anybody with me? But well, we don't have to worry about what tomorrow holds. We only have to believe in Him who holds our tomorrow. I don't know what's going to take place tomorrow. 
Amen. The market could drop out tomorrow. Everything could be shut down tomorrow. Amen. We, we may have to become more self-sufficient. Uh, amen. We may have to plant more gardens, and we may have to, amen, do without. But you know what? He still holds my tomorrow. In fact, it's like this. This world is not my home. My tomorrow is somewhere beyond the blue. You see, we have to trust in the Lord, knowing with whom we believe. I want to go to the book of Joshua now, the 10th chapter. And in Joshua, the 10th chapter, the children of Israel are coming into the land. And there they come, come up against some Amorites, five kings. And for the lack of time, I won't go into all the detail. You can read it for yourself. It's a wonderful story. But these five kings come up against the children of Israel. And the Lord tells Joshua, you don't have to be afraid. I've given them into your hand. And so the children of Israel begin to battle these five kings. And these five kings of the Amorites, amen, they fled. Verse 16, but these five kings fled and hid themselves in a cave at Makeda, or Makeda, however you want to say it. And it was told Joshua, saying, the five kings are found hid in a cave at Makeda. And Joshua said, roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave and set men by it for to keep them. You see, those five kings, I'm sure, thought that they would come to the children of God and put fear into their hearts because they had joined together. You know what I've learned about the devils that we fight? They don't ever fight alone. They, they want to bring all their friends with you. That's why when, you know, uh, Jesus addressed the man at Gadaree. And sometimes we... We, 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 we think that the demonic spirits that we're fighting are just, uh, you know, chaotic and not organized. But I want to tell you something. We better be organized in our fight because they're organized in theirs. Those spirits said we're legions. That's a military term the Romans used that meant a, a block that they, they stood shoulder to shoulder and they marched in a formation, amen, that was hard to penetrate, hard to break down. And so basically those demonic spirits says, we're a legion, we're many. But we're here and we're not ready to go. And sometimes spirits come at us in a way, amen, it, you know, many times doubt is always attached with unbelief. And fear, mistrust. But these five kings hid in that cave. And I've learned this, that when you begin to fight demons, you know what? They run. That's why the word of God says, resist the devil and he will flee. And it came to pass when Joshua and the children of Israel had made an end of the slain of them with a very great slaughter till they were consumed, that the rest which remained of them entered into fenced cities. And all the people returned to the camp to Joshua at Makeda in peace, now moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. Then said Joshua, open the mouth of the cave. Sometimes you don't need to let them demonic spirits hide. I'm talking about in your house. Because, you know, when you get a little victory, they hide. That's the spirit of the Amorite, the Amalekite. As long as they had the victory over you, they're going to come and attack you and torment you. But when you showed a little resistance, they ran to the mountains and hid in the caves. And yet these, I think these five kings could very well represent some spirits today. And Joshua brought brought those five kings unto him out of the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war, which went with him, come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and they put their feet upon the necks of them. Sometimes you need to call the spirits that are attacking your house out. 
But what? I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel it in a, in, a, in a surging this morning. A strength. But there are things that are attacking your home. And I've said it before and I, I tell people to do this. Because this is just how I was raised. When things kept coming against our house... I can remember waking up at 2 or 3 in the morning with my father with a bottle of anointing oil. I plead your blood, Jesus. I talk about scaring me half to death, but he was doing spiritual warfare. Devil, you have no place in this home. He anointed doorposts. He anointed bedrooms. He anointed every portion of the house. Amen. But he wanted to make sure there was a covering over the house. What was he doing? He was saying, spirits, I recognize you're in my home and you're not welcome. Amen. Now it's one thing to do spiritual warfare here. But you don't live here. You know, this is kind of a place of refuge. This sanctuary. Amen. I know at the doors, and I don't want any unclean spirit to come in this house, Lord. Amen. I pray, Lord, let the angels of the Lord camp about the sanctuary. Amen. So I really feel this is a place of refuge. Amen, a place where you can get some encouragement. To, but you're going to walk back out those doors. And the devils that were there when you walked in will be there when you walk out. But the difference is, is your attitude. Either I will let them control me with fear, or I will take dominion over them. Some of you need to go home. Take that devil, throw it on the ground in Jesus' name, put your foot on it, and say, not in my house. Not one more day. I'm not going to be afraid of you. I'm not going to let you control me. Because Joshua said unto them, fear not. I'm telling somebody this morning, fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. I'm telling you in the spirit, for we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness. If we will put them under our feet and know that God's got them right where you don't have to be afraid. You can be of good courage, for the Lord is on your side. You say, I'm battling a sickness. I'm battling disease. That's all right. Say, disease, you have no dominion over me. I'm going to trust in the Lord. Amen. You can face the fear of death knowing that God is on your side. You see, I feel like those five kings could even represent these five things. Doubt. Unbelief. Unforgiveness. Hopelessness. And I don't know why, but the Lord put this in me. Ungenerosity. Because those five things are detrimental to one that is walking in the Spirit. If you walk in doubt, you'll never believe. If you walk in doubt, you'll never have faith. If you allow unbelief to be a part of you, you'll never see a miracle. If you allow unforgiveness to stay in your spirit, you'll never be released to walk in the freedom of the Holy Ghost. You determine what shackles will be broken. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. You determine what shackles will be broken. If you want to stay shackled in unforgiveness, that's all right. That's your choice. But there's a, sh there's a Savior that can break every chain. You can be like the man that the Lord asked, do you believe? I believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. It, we, we may deal with that, but you know what? You can put that spirit of unbelief in its place. You can put the spirit of doubt in its place and hopelessness. If you want to rankle my spiritual rankness, I guess. <laughs> this, this right here. I have to pray through every time somebody says this to me. Because my flesh wants to just pop them upside the head. You know, like your dad did you when you was a kid. 
can't do that anymore because it's abuse. But, you know, back in the day, you did something unintelligent. I got to be careful with my words because I get in trouble. But when you do something unintelligent, you know, your dad would, pay attention, boy. Yes, sir. That's how I feel sometimes. Well, when I, when I feel that spirit of hopelessness. Well, we'll never be able to do that around here, Brother Bumgarner. This is just the way it's always been. Really? Well, keep fueling my fire because every time I hear that, that just makes me want to prove you wrong all the more. I'm not hopeless. I don't live in hopelessness. You shouldn't live in hopelessness either. I'm a child of God. What God has for me is for me. Oh, come on now, somebody. Don't you know God's made plans for you to bless you? Don't you know God's made plans in your life to make you something special? Amen. And what he has for you is for you. And you don't have to share with anybody else. Amen. You're not hopeless this morning. And yet we can get wallowing in hopelessness. Uh, saying it'll never be for me. Uh, I can never achieve that. But you know what? If God wills it, it'll happen. Hopelessness. Hopelessness. Well, it's always been that way, brother. Well, we're going to change that. First, we've got to change the mindset. Uh, we got to put hopelessness out the door. Hopelessness, you don't belong in my home. You know what? I just, I'm, I'm just going to step out there and really, really speak some things. And I don't want you to think I'm going off the deep end. I'm definitely not charismatic, but I want you to hear this preacher. Hey, man, you can step in your home and say, this is a $150,000 a year home. That's our income. You see, I spoke that and some of y'all went, well, brother, but... I didn't say it wouldn't come with a little work. I didn't say you couldn't achieve that through time. But it can happen if you keep believing it. You say, but Brother Bumgarner, we're doing good to make 30, 40,000 a year now. That's because that's where you're living. That's where your mindset is. But when you begin to trust in God and say, Lord, here's where I'd like my income to be. Here's where I'd like to see myself. And it doesn't have to be that figure. I'm just speaking in faith this morning. I'm just talking to you in a reality that you can become whatever you want to become if you speak it in faith and not doubt and fear. Fear says, no, your daddy didn't make that. How do you expect to make that? Your mama never went to college. How do you expect to make it through college? Through him, I can do anything. My hope is not in the things of this world. But my hope is in him. It is in him I trust. Amen. If we had time, I could tell you there are those in this church who have that mentality. Amen. And you would ask them, how did it happen? And they started saying, Lord, if you'll bless me, I'll use it for your glory. I'll do it for you, Lord. I'll give it to you. I'll make sure you get the glory, Lord. Amen. And that goes to tie into the next one, ungenerosity. Come on. It seems like any time people get upset with the Lord or get upset with the pastor of the church, amen, their generous spirit just dies with them. Well, that's the truth. So you, you, you give, your giving is predicated upon your state of mind. And if fear controls your state of mind, you'll never give. Because I got bills to pay. Honey, I've had bills to pay. I didn't have nothing to give but a dollar. I gave a dollar. Amen. And I paid my tithes. Come on. Come on. And it hurt to pay tithes. Amen. But I paid them anyway. Yes. Amen. 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 You know what? The Lord sustained me. The Lord blessed me. I mean, he blew my mind. It's in the hard times when you trust him that he sees if you can handle the small things. You know why some of you aren't millionaires? He can't trust you with a million dollars. He said, if I can trust you with a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, then I'll trust you with a 
$100,000. And when I can trust you with $100,000, then I might trust you with a million dollars. Amen. But if your giving's predicated upon your state of mind, too many times when you get carnal, you stop giving. Now, I'm not preaching this because I'm trying to boost anything. I'm just preaching this because it's the truth. Amen. It's the truth. I've been in this church all my life, and I've seen people. Amen. People that were blessed, you know, and, and they thought they could control things with their giving. You know what I found out about them? Amen. They're quick to fall. They don't walk so tall when they lose their big paying job and they can't find another one for a while. It's so quickly how they become humbled. Amen. I'm just preaching this morning. You know what? I want to have a giving spirit. My giving's not going to be controlled by fear. I said my giving's not going to be controlled by fear. I got bills just like everybody else. I got to pay things just like everybody else. Amen. But I send my tithes check into the district every month uh, faithfully. Uh, amen. And I thank God that I can. I, think, I shout about it. I get excited about it. Amen. I love to give in the offering. As long as my wife remembers to give me my check. Because she holds the checkbook. And there's nothing wrong with that. I trust her. I know it's in good hands. But too many times, fear, amen, those spirits come into us and they control us. But you don't have to worry if you're walking with the Lord. Hey. Every job, God's provided. Every raise, the Lord has given. My father worked for the same place for over 20-something years. Never once asked for a raise. I said, Dad, how come you never asked for a raise? He said, well, if the Lord thinks I need one, he'll give me one. Or he'll provide another way for me to make a little more money. Now that's an attitude, folks. Because too many times when we're working, we get an entitlement spirit. Well, you're not paying me what I'm worth. And that's true in some situations. And when I was a recruiter, I loved people that didn't feel like they were getting paid what they're worth because they were usually right, and I could always find them a better job making a little bit more than I could make some commission. <laughs> Amen. But the truth is, is that when we trust in God... He has a way of opening every door. Amen. The enemy will attack us with fear, but in the midst of that fear, we'll trust in God. God will say, why are you fearing, child of God? Don't you realize I'm working over here for you? Don't you know I'm opening this door that's going to be even better? How many times has it been? How many times have I heard stories? I'm trying to encourage somebody. Amen. Somebody gets fired from one job and they're wondering, what am I going to do? But then they turn around and God blesses them with a job paying them twice as much as they made before. And the problem is they were such a good, a good employee at the old place that they would have never left the old place unless they got fired or got laid off. But sometimes God has to lay us off or get us fired so God can give us what he wants to give us. So I'm telling somebody, don't be afraid of what you can't control or what you can't handle. God's got you. He's got you, set you setting you up so he can bless you. Don't be afraid. Live beyond the fear factor and walk in faith. First Chronicles 28 and 20, I'm trying to hurry. And David said to Solomon, his son, be strong and of good courage and do it. Now in this story, he's talking about building the temple. He's talking about promoting the kingdom forward. He's talking about uh, the things to come. David has just given a great uh, speech to all the land. And now to Solomon, his son, he looks to his son and he says, Now I know this is a great task, uh, one that I can't do because I've got blood on my hands. But I want you to be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. Can I tell somebody today, I don't want to just say a cliche saying, but I think Nike got it right. 
just do it. If God's called you to do something, just do it. Amen. If God's put you in a place on a job, do it with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength uh, and live for God and be a witness uh, and complete the work that God has called you to do. Yes. Amen. Amen. Don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Don't let fear say you'll never achieve it. Keep reading. Keep praying. Keep seeking God. Keep preparing. Yes. Championships aren't won in the championship. They're won on the first day of practice. Hey Amen. If the Lord has called you to do something, then don't give up. Can I say that again? If the Lord has called you to do something, don't give up. Hold on to that promise. Hold on to that vision. He isn't finished with you yet. Paul wrote in Philippians, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hold on. Don't give up. You don't have to fear people. You don't have to fear obstacles if the Lord is on your side. Just do it. Be strong and of good courage and know that the Lord is on my side. You see, we can't live in fear. Look at somebody and say, I can't live in fear. I've got to live in faith. Because the just shall, not maybe, not they should, but the shall kind of removes all doubt. Doesn't give you any wiggle room. And if you're going to be just before the Lord, you shall live by faith. And the only thing that's going to push you on beyond the fear factor is faith. Because I care not today what the morrow may bring. If shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything. And all of my worries are vain. Though tempest may blow and the storm clouds arrive. Obscuring the brightness of life. I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies. The master looks on at the strife. I know that he safely will carry me through, no matter what evils betide. Why should I then care though the tempest may blow if Jesus walks close by my side? Our Lord will return for his loved ones someday. Our troubles will then all be o'er. The master so gently will lead us away beyond the blessed heavenly shore. And what is the chorus? Living by faith in Jesus above. Trusting, confiding in his great love. From our harm safe in a sheltering arm. I'm living by faith and I feel no alarm. Come on somebody, I want you to live by faith this morning. I want you to move beyond the fear factor. I want you to live in faith. I want you to live trusting in God, knowing he's got you. Will you stand with me this morning? Musicians, will you come? David quotes in Psalms 3 and 1, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah. But thou, O oh Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. He says, I won't be afraid of ten thousands that have set themselves round about me. Because I know, O oh Lord, that you will save me. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Perhaps this morning you've been battling fear and doubt and unbelief. Perhaps you're in a situation where there seems to be no hope, no, no, no way of escape. Yet I'm encouraging you today, won't you come?
Say, Lord, I refuse to live in fear one more day. I refuse to let doubt and unbelief and unforgiveness and hopelessness and my ungenerosity, Lord, to control me anymore, Lord. But I am going to give to you everything I have. I'm going to trust in you, Lord, today. I give this situation. Maybe it's health in your body. Lord, I give you the health of my body. Perhaps it's a financial need. Lord, I'm going to give you this financial situation. Perhaps it's a marital situation. Perhaps you need to give your marriage to the Lord today. Stop living in fear. Stop living in fear. Come on, somebody. I'm telling somebody. Stop living in fear. Come on, I'm going to trust you, Lord. Lord, I know you have the right job for me. I know you have the right income for me, Lord. I'm not going to be bound by fear anymore, Lord. But I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to trust in you, Lord. Come on, I feel the Holy Ghost this morning. I want you to give it to the Lord. This is to the church today. I'm going to give my health to you, Lord. I know it's changing and I'm battling things, but I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give my home to you. I'm going to give my marriage to you. Come on, I feel these things rolling in my spirit, Lord. I, I want to give you everything, Lord. I want to trust in you. I want to believe in you. Come on, somebody. Pray with your neighbor beside you. Let's pray one for another. Lord, I want faith to take over our church. I believe, God, you're going to work it. You're working for 